Good morning, everyone. This is devotional number 10, actually. This is uh, the 10th week uh, consecutive that we are doing the teaching on Bibliology, the Doctrine of the Scriptures, and uh, we have covered quite extensively a few documents and so on. So tonight, um, I'm going to make the best of my ability to be able to finish, actually. Welcome to those who are in class with us, and welcome to those who are committed so faithfully to follow us online. Why don't we start with a brief a few seconds of silent time, and then a word of prayer, and then we'll carry on on our studies on canonicity and authority. Gracious Father, we give you thanks for the privilege to do it again. Open the eyes of our heart that we may behold wonderful things from your law. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, again, uh, once again, my best advice to you, it's always to go back to uh, the previous week to uh, slide the bar until the end of the program of week number nine to know exactly what we left. So, as you know, we're going to commit 35, maybe 40 weeks, maybe 30, I don't know exactly how, on the doctrine of the scriptures, bibliology, which is, again, like I say to you uh, through the course of the last few weeks, that we are laying a foundation. We're laying a foundation to test, if we, if we, it, not to test, but to understand that we have a very reliable body of scriptures on which we will build upon with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through the course of the teaching and so on. But we're not of the bush yet with the doctrine of the scriptures. So this is division number four. Canonicity and authority. You can tick mark definitions. It's covered completely. Basic foundations covered completely as well. If you want to know everything about these things, you just watch the previous videos. Test of canonicity behind us as well. Last week, we get into the Old Testament scriptures to determine if they are canonic canonical and if they have such a thing as authority. We have looked from a Jewish perspective, the three divisions, the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's the Jewish canon. And we're still laboring there. That's why this is on the line in red. I would try to finish this today, cover this, and cover the disputed books as well. So uh, we might go a little bit longer today, maybe 40 to 45 minutes. So sharpen your pencils. I will repeat the scriptures twice and so on. And then we follow the same format. Under the Old Testament scriptures, we look, are they genuine? Do they bear credibility? And are they canonical? And we will do the same thing with the New Testament. We will use the same format here. And these are two words that I will explain under capital F, the disputed books, homolegumena or antilegumena. I will explain to you what it's all about concerning the canon. So right now I'm committed to finish. That's where we finish uh, last week. And now I'm committed to carry on right there. Would you turn with me in the book of Luke? Luke's account, 24 to 44. The book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 24 to 44. Just a, a, a note for you about 44. We still carry on under the canonicity of the Old Testament. The book of Luke 24 to 44, it says this, Now he said to them, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me, and this is the part that I want here, beloved, things that are written about me, look at my fingers in the law of Moses, that's the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. So even the Lord Jesus Christ recognized the threefold division based upon official position or status of the individual authors. So that's what I say here. The threefold divisions is based upon the official position or status of the, of the individual authors. Make a note that this is not based or greater on greater or lesser canonicity. This is not based on later a greater or lesser canonicity, but it's based upon the status of the person and also the position of the person of the individual. For instance, the law 
means law giver. The prophets, the second division of the Old Testament canon, the prophets are based both upon the office and gifts of prophecy. The prophets both, about the, uh, both on the office and gift of prophecy. And the writings, it's the gift of prophecy for those who had the gift of prophecy but did not have the office of a prophet. So this is how it works. It's not based upon greater or lesser canonicity on authority. It's based upon law giving. The prophets are based upon both those who held the office and have the gift of prophecy. And the writing, it's based upon those who had the gift of prophecy, such as Daniel, without necessarily holding the office of a prophet. Furthermore, the three divisions of the canon goes back into ancient history. A fellow like Flavius Josephus, which is a first century uh, Jewish historian, wrote a work about in 100 AD. His work is against Apion against Apion, and he says this, quote, he says, there is no canonical writings since Malachi. So prophecy since uh, ceased after Malachi, so the canon was basically closed at that time. It's in the word against, in the work against Apion in chapter 1, verse 8. No words of prophecy after Malachi. Philo, from which we have the word philosophy type of thing. Philo in 40 AD did mention also, beloved, the threefold division. The New Testament also recognized the threefold. Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. Luke 11, verse 51. And the famous Luke that I just gave you, chapter 24, verse 44 mentioning the two divisions, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. It doesn't say the writing. It's because sometimes the first book of the division, the division is named after the first book. So the first book of the writings here is the book of Psalms, and that's why Luke goes with the Psalms and so on. Another point concerning all this, concerning the canonicity, is the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a work that was completed in 250 BC. 250 BC, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it does recognize the three divisions of the Jew Jewish canon. So maybe what is very important for you to make a note right now, it's by 300 BC, by the year 300 BC, the tenon of the scriptures was closed. So when you ask yourself maybe a question, what kind of a Bible the Lord Jesus Christ was using in the first century Israel, the canon was closed. So the Jewish people of the first century when Christ Jesus came, the canon was closed. So and on the scroll, they had the three divisions of the Old Testament because by 300 BC, the Old Testament was closed and divided into the three parts that you have, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Now, maybe the last questions concerning that before we embark into the New Testament canon. How do they collected the canon? How the canon was put together? How was it collected? That's your question, because we have 39 books. Even if the Jews, they have a different order, the quantity of book is the same as the Christian order that we have because the Jewish canon goes from Genesis to 2 Chronicles. We have learned that together. And the Christian order goes from Genesis to Malachi. But the amount of books are the same, despite the fact that the Jews, the first and second Samuel for the Jewish people is one book, for us two books, but that does differ that much, and it's not really a big deal. So the major concern is Ezra, of your book of Ezra. So the, uh, collective, uh, the collection of the canon basically began with Ezra of your Bible of the Great Synagogue. That's what we call the Sanhedrin, the Great Council, about the 5th century BC. Ezra is called the scribe in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1, verse 4, and verse 9. 
And also in, in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 26, Ezra is called the scribe. And also in Ezra chapter 7, verse 6, he is called in chapter 7, verse 6, a scribe of the law of Moses. So it began with him. And the threefold division was recognized by the New Testament. I just said it in Luke 24, 44. And the Old Testament has genuineness, credibility, as you follow on the board, and canonicity. And it was determined, it was basically approved by the Council of Yavne in 1980. The Council of Yamni or Yamnia, if you want to. Sorry, Yamnia. It was called this way before Yamni. Yavne basically is a city in Israel. So in 1980, the Jewish canon was completely closed and recognized and so on. I don't know if you follow me, but again, the best way to go with these studies, beloved, is always to go back towards the end of session number nine, uh, the, the session number nine of, of the scriptures and so on. So if you follow one by one, that's the best way to go for you to get the most of it, because you know that this is extensive. This is not only a basic Bible study, but this is a place where we get grounded and we go in depth. We're done with this. You can tick mark this. Now we get into the New Testament. And if you follow me, basically to help you out, we can get rid of all this for the time being. And now we go back. New Testament, and we use the same format. Genuineness, does it have credibility? Is it canonical? That's what we look at right now concerning the New Testament. This will be slightly less extensive. So once again, genuineness, genuineness emphasizes authenticity. Authenticity. Make your note. The gospel were authored. The four gospels account were authored by the people that bear their name. Matthew was written by Matthew. Easy enough. Mark by Mark, Luke by Luke, and John by John the Apostle. There is a letter by a fellow called Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Baptist, by the way, and he is one person of the church father, Polycarp, Polycarp basically, that, that, test, that testified that the authors of the gospel were really the people that wrote their gospel. You can Google Polycarp, P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P, and you will find that person online and so on, and uh, you will have more information concerning that person. As we carry on, Acts was written by Luke. The Pauline epistles by Paul, all of them has a superscription, superscription stating that they were written by Paul. Then we have the general epistles. All of them has superscriptions. All of them do have superscriptions, except the book of Hebrews, because the book of Hebrews in your Bible, we simply don't know for sure the author of the, uh, of the book of Hebrews. The famous book that one day we'll teach online too, uh, time allowing and God's allowing, the book of Revelation was written by John the Apostle. And all the books, we still look at that genuineness, all the books were accounted for, the books of the New Testament, the 27 books. We have 27 books in the New Testament, were accounted for by the year 115 CE or AD, except for 2 Peter, Jude, 2nd and 3rd John. I will come back to that. So all the books were accounted for except from 2nd Peter, Jude, 2nd and 3rd John. The style was very much like the first century style of literature of these books. And we have also, to prove the genuineness or authenticity of these books, we have historical illusion in the person of Herod, Herod Agrippa, Festus, Felix, Pontius Pilate, Herod the Great, and so on. These, per these people, beloved, we cannot miss the mark. When you go with Herod Agrippa, Herod the Great, Herod Agrippa, like I just mentioned, Felix and Festus, 
Nobody can deny, beloved, that these people were truly in existence. So once again, as I move on, I want you to develop a good relationship, of course, with the Lord, but to trust the Bible that you have. When you get a good translation, we have a very trustworthy body of written truth. Credibility concerning the New Testament. You follow me? We've looked at this in the exact same way that we did the Old Testament. Now we get into the credibility. What does this emphasize? If you are credible, you are truthfulness. So the New Testament. Just four comments. They were given by competent witnesses. These guys were authors of the New Testament. They were competent people. They had the opportunity to observe and to investigate. Luke put his gospel together by means of investigation. They have the opportunity to observe what was being done by the Lord Messiah for those who were eyewitness and to inquire, example by Luke. They were men of discernment. These guys were not easily deceived. Matthew, John, and Peter were eyewitnesses. They witnessed miracle. They walked with Christ, followed the Messiah. Mark was the interpreter of Peter. Luke was a companion of Paul and received Paul's authority as an apostolic, apostolic legate. Paul, the famous Paul of the second circle of the, of the, of the uh, um, apostles, were basically appointed by Christ himself. Reference. Galatians chapter 1, 11 to 17. James and Jude were half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were honest witness, witnesses because their testimony, when they put these gospels together, it was against their advantage. So they were not trickful type of thing. They were not trying to fool the people because writing such a thing back in the first century was to the cost of their lives. So they were indeed honest witnesses. And they also did show themselves in a not favor favorable light. They also record their own shortcomings. So if you would re write a book of, uh, about yourself, you can deter the flaws that you have, the mistakes that they did. But they recorded themselves and they showed themselves not always in a favor 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 favorable way all the time. Uh, thirdly, maybe harmonization. They supported each other. The writer that supported each other. Their difference shows a lack of conspiracy. Their difference does not show any divisions and so on. It shows basically it's, they supplement one another. They do not contradict one another. The gospel writer, despite the fact that they record things differently, we will see that if we do the life of Christ one day from A to Z, but their difference in style does not show contradiction. It shows instead supplement. Synoptic. Do you know the word synoptic? Mark, Mark, Matthew, Luke are synoptic. It means that they are a summary. John fits well with the other synoptic writers as well. Acts lays the basis for the Pauline epistles. The book of Acts lays the basis for the Pauline epistles. And all the others harmonize accordingly as well. They bear also conformity. They conform with all historical circumstances that we have. They conform with secular history. For instance, Corinius, Herod the Great, like I mentioned, Herod Agrippa, Herod Philip, Archelius, Galo, Festus, and Felix. Okay, that was credibility. Once again, might go fast a little bit, but online, not the students in class though. But you guys online on YouTube, you can always rewind, pause me to finalize your notes as well. Now we take the canonicity, number three. Canonicity means authority. Authority as being the words of God, basically. When these books were given, there was an immediate recognition of divine authority in them. Would you make your notes, references? First, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. First, Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 2, verses 7. 11, 17, and 29. 
again, we labor uh, uh, under immediate recognition of divine authority. Scriptures again, Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, the writings were circulated among the churches. The letters, encyclical letters, they meant to be read publicly among the churches. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, the collections of the sacred books. By the end of the second century, all but seven books were reconciled and accepted. And make a note that by 397 A.D., all the 27 books of the New Testament were recognized as being canonical. I repeat that. By 397 A.D., common era, of course, all the 27 books were recognized as being canonical. I just made a statement right now. I said that by the end of the second century, all but seven books were reconciled and accepted, and that will lead to it in a moment. So you can take a deep breath right now. I'm going to try to finish the teaching because we come to this right now and we will be done with canonicity and authority. That was extensive, beloved, but I need to do it once again. Before we get in theology proper, Christology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, we need to be grounded. It is imperative to be grounded nowadays in the church age to recognize that we have a very trustworthy uh, 66 books of the scriptures and that's how we find that out recognizing history going through the tedious together and embrace that kind of stuff to build our theology together not to be misled by any wind of doctrine that goes around nowadays even within the church age so I know you understand these things and I know that you treat these things lo uh, beloved as being very precious we get into that right now are you ready Just two words that could be a little bit difficult, disputed books type of thing, because I said to you that some books were, not con were, were, not, were disputed and so on. Homo legumena. Homo legumena. Let's go it for a third time for your sake. Homo legumena. Homo legumena. You can slash it here. This is a word that means confessed. We're talking about books here. This is a word that means confessed. Or recognize if you want to. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament of 39 books, 34 were confessed. 34 were confessed. In the New Testament, out of 27 books that we have there, 20 were accepted also and confessed. So that's why this word here, homologumena, means confessed book. Number two, antilegomena goes with this one. Antilegomena goes with the one above. This word here means spoken against. Spoken against. That's the book that is spoken against. Okay. It was basically put here that these books were debated prior to their acceptance. It took longer time to insert them in the canon. That's exactly what we mean by that. Homo legumena, they were confessed right away, but anti legumena, they were spoken against for a reason that I just give you right now as we close soon. They became part of the canon, but it took a longer time. They were spoken against. Okay? They were spoken against by Yavne, by the Council of Yavne in 1980. Which book were spoken against? Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Song of Songs. Because of its erotic flavor. It has a sexual connotation, so it became inserted in the canon later for the very reason that I gave you. The second book that was Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, because it portrays a lot of pessimism. So they found the book a little bit too pessimistic and it was spoken against for that reason, later inserted into the canon. The book of Esther, because God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, you don't find the word God in the book of Esther. And it was disputed for that reason, spoken against. 
Proverbs, the book was Proverbs, was spoken against because of an appearing contradiction in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4 seems to contradict verse 5. And for that only reason, it took a longer time to insert that into the canon. Ezekiel, that I cherish a lot because of his description of the temple, sacrificial system, and so on, took a longer time to be uncertain in the canon, mainly for the doctrine of um, replacement theology and also uh, a millennialistic perspective and so on. Uh, that's why basically this book took a longer time to be accepted. So you see, the five books of the scriptures became canonical. They became disputed books, and later on they were inserted in the canon. It's going to be a longer session. I know you bear with me, beloved. Let's talk about the New Testament. Seven books were antilegomena books. Hebrews, number one, was spoken against because of the uncertainty of the author. Since there is no superscription for the book of Hebrews, are you with me? So it was antilegomena. James, because it seems to contradict the apostles. Second Peter. It was disputed because it's a different style of writing than 1 Peter. 2 John and 3 John, simply put, because of these two books, 2 John and 3 John, because they were two personals, they were debated. And also Jude was debated because it makes reference to the book of Enoch. And there is also, there was, they said that there was too many similarities with 2 Peter. And Revelation, of course, was also disputed because of the millennial doctrine, which I cherish very much, became disputed, uh, uh, um, inserted later, uh, but uh, came later because, to some extent, it was spoken against. You guys online also might be familiar with the word Apocrypha. It's a collection of books written between 200 B.C., before Christ, and 100 A.D., they were not accepted in the canon. So you might have a Bible with the Apocrypha, but they're not canonical. The Pseudopigrapha, Pseudopigrapha, it means simply, no big deal here, false inscri inscription. They are stated to be authored between 200 BC and 200 AD by people, basically, that were not true. So they were not accepted in the canon, either by Jewish consuls such as Yavne and also later on church consul of the first fathers and so on. Beloved, I know it was quite meaty and consistent today, but we are done with that part. So one thing, one thing. We do have a very accurate text. We start with this, it's a foundation. And we're not done with bibliology. We come to the most interesting in the weeks to come as we will get into uh, the covenants of the scriptures, dispensationalism, the, the, the many dispensations. So we are there for a ride. It's going to be a good uh, learning cur curve for all of us. God worked out a truthful body of scripture with no addition, with no added books, and nothing left out. So God in his superintendence, in his love for us, has provided us with everything we need, beloved. We don't need any additional books, and we don't need to substru substract any of it, as teaching it being too diff difficult to teach, su such as the book, book of Revelation, and so on. So my only message, as you can see, a little bit of bumpiness. I'm just human. Sometimes I get so excited about these things. Beloved, we do have a very thrust, trustful or trustworthy is the word body of scriptures on which I invite you to look at it daily, to build your foundation upon it, to keep on learning with the scriptures. Next week, we will attack um, illumination and preservation. As we continue, we'll spend most of the 30 some weeks, maybe 40 weeks in the doctrine of the scriptures and so on. At this point, a very light, gentle reminder to support the ministry when you go on the website where you find these devotionals. You have a button. You can give through PayPal. You can give directly by mail. You have all the tools necessary, beloved, to
to follow through with your support in prayer, with your support for this location that will have will undergo some changes soon. So we trust you for your stewardship in it. We thank you for your patience with TSM. We know it is extensive and we are committed to pray for your growth with these things. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this time together. I pray for the students that they may uh, listen to it carefully and that you may, Father, guide them in the truth. And we give you thanks in advance for all these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Sword Ministries bid you shalom. Thank you.